Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, we are continuing our series in the book of Galatians. Um, if you are visiting with us for the very first time today, I usually send out the lesson via email to the members of the church, so it's a little bit easier to follow along, as well as you can go back and double check what I say, build your own convictions on the Word of yeah. God. So, if you would like to receive that, I'm kind of nudge the person to your left or to your right. They'll forward that email to you, and you can follow along. If not, and you just want to turn in your Bibles, you can just turn to Galatians chapter 3. Come on. You know, uh, this week, as I was reflecting over Galatians chapter 3 and continuing in our next chapter, you'll see here that as you receive the email, it says part 1. <laughs> Why? Because I was reading it this week, yeah. Galatians 3, and I got to about verse 15 to 20, and I said, nope. No, I do not understand this at all. Oh, and I was like, okay, I, I needed I needed extra time. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let, we'll break it up so we can really reflect and get the meat of what Paul here is trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and what's pretty cool is, as we remember, this is one of the first books actually written in the New Testament. It wasn't the Gospels. It was the book of Galatians, which was one of the letters of Paul that was being circulated before the Gospels were even being circulated. Oh, wow. And it's kind of funny because you start to see kind of this growing that Paul has. Yeah. Because as we were reading in the beginning of this, if this letter that he was writing to the Galatian church, um, you see that Paul had no patience at all. Mm. We read on later on that in the book of um, Corinthians, he prays for the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had so many issues. Mm. He didn't pray for Galatians. Oh. Oh. Paul, Paul had a different lack of patience when it came to the Galatian church. Right. And it's kind of funny. It almost gets you thinking about, as Paul continued to grow in his fight for the truth, it gets you kind of remembering, of when you meet a veteran and a new re recruit in the army today, you, you can tell the difference a bit. Yeah. Not just in age, but the reason that they are fighting. Some vets today may regret their decision to go and fight, but some others may be honored. But you start to see that the reason they're fighting is totally different when they first sign up. You know, when they first sign up, it's pride, it's some moral, probably, duty that they had to serve. But later on, it, it becomes something a little bit more personal. Yeah. As they start to fight, it's not just for country and for people. It's for their person, for their left or their right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And as you continue reading in Paul's letter here, you start to read that, yes, he still lacks a bit of patience with these guys, mm -hmm. but he starts digging deeper of why are they doing this? Mm -hmm. Why should they continue to fight for the truth? We're going to read here in verse 1. It says here in Galatians 1, uh, 3, 1, You foolish Galatians! Already he's getting that. Yeah. Who bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. We stop here for a moment, and just what Paul is trying to say to these guys. He says here, you had clear proof of the truth about Jesus in him crucified. Yet you were still bewitched. You were still deceived. You still believe what you are doing is right, even though it is clearly wrong. Wow. And this puts on our hearts a bit. Sometimes people will say, well, hey, if I had proof, then I would follow it. But we understand proof it does not make a warrior. It's quite easy when people say, hey, I need to, you have to prove God to me, then I'll follow him. I'm like, no, you, no, you won't. Mm. Do you believe uh, working out is, is, is good for you? Yeah, yeah, I believe that. Do, has that been proven in your life? Yeah. Do you do it every day? No. Proof, proof has nothing to do with it. You lack heart. People don't need proof. They need heart. Come on, John. And even here he's saying, you guys, you had the proof, but now your heart has been bewitched. There's something in your heart that got messed up. If anybody is asking for proof, yeah, in some cases we, we need to be able to, to defend the gospel and the truth that we are pro proclaiming to people. But it's not ever about usually proof. It's about, do you have the character to follow Christ? Wow. Come on. And see, here wow. he, he starts to talk to hey, it is not that our minds deceive us. It's not that our minds are the most deceitful, but we read in the scriptures, it is our heart that is the most deceitful. Mm. Your heart deceives you in thinking that you are doing what is right or what is smart. Mm. 
You're doing it because you thought of it. You see, the Galatians, at this point, they thought they were following a good teaching, but yet they had been misled. And I think it's, it's quite easy for a lot of us, and I believe even in the modern-day church, we can be terribly guilty of making little bits of the Bible, taking little bits of it, and making it say what we want it to say. Right. Yeah. We're terribly guilty of that. Even us today in this church as well. That we always have to go back to what is the Bible trying to teach us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, 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 if it's not us just trying to make the Bible say what we want to say. We gather others around us that want uh, what we want to hear, right? In 2 Timothy 4.3 it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching, itching ears want to hear. You know, not only do we want to change the Bible to what we want it to say, but we gather other people <laughs> around us to kind of do and say the same thing right there. You know, it's kind of funny. It says, there's a saying out there. It says, the weirdest thing said about the Bible is after 10 p.m. on TV. <laughs> Usually because that's when uh, time is cheap, you know on TV, and it's when all the false teachers get on there and they start teaching some weird things because time is cheap and people are going to listen to them. Mm. See, we have to go back and get from the Bible what the Bible is trying to teach us. Yeah. Even the Galatians here, part of the first century church, were being be bewitched. Wow. See, being inspired, the Bible, when it says it's inspired by God, it doesn't mean that the authors who wrote it had God in mind when they wrote it. Mm inspired that claim in the scriptures, meaning it came directly from God. Right. That sometimes people can do, they can say, oh, well, I did this because I was inspired by God or I was inspired to do God's will. That's not the same thing. Hmm. Inspired means coming directly from God. Hmm. And what to just say about that is no speaker today is inspired. Hmm. Not one. I am chosen by God to preach his word. I am not chosen to preach directly God is speaking through me. Right. You, you got to understand that. That not one person today is inspired by God. They may be chosen, but any person can be bewitched by the scriptures. Yeah. And so what he's teaching them here is that, that hey, we got to get back to the Bible and the truth. And we're going to see throughout this of why. Yeah. Why should we be fighting this fight? That their problem was not ignorance. Their problem was not that they didn't understand. The problem was that they were just thinking about turning away from it. Mm. See, Paul is now a vet, and he's teaching these new recruits of why they should continue to fight this fight. Mm. My title of my lesson this morning is It Comes Down to Trust. Mm. On, Point number one is Law or Lord. You know, whenever you see something wrong, usually you can kind of expose it by just one little question. We're going to see what his question is here. Galatians 3, verse 2 through 3. He said, I would like to just learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh. Paul here, he just had this question to get them thinking and to remember their history right here. He pretty much just had them, hey guys, I want you to remember, how were you saved? Asking them, how did you receive the Spirit once you did? Was it your performance that got you into the kingdom? Or was it something different? What, what, was it just how you acted that got you into the kingdom? What, was it something bigger? And he says, talking about, hey, you believed what you heard. Well, what did they hear? Well, it was the same gospel that was preached to everyone. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36 through 41, it says, Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, from all whom our Lord, our God, will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to that number that day. It talks about here that the, the gospel or the message that they would have heard was the same message that Peter preached yeah. on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And that what how they received the Spirit was they believed the gospel, <laughs> but they repented and got baptized in the name of, of Jesus Christ right here. That believing in your sacrifices was not enough. That, hey, I, all that, my repentance in me believing that I'm doing what's right and I'm going to follow you, Jesus, it, he's saying that wasn't enough. You just believing that you're a good person wasn't enough. That's not how you got the Spirit, right? No, instead you had a trust in the one who came here and sacrificed his life for you. He talks about it in the waters of baptism, and we understand in Colossians chapter 2 that, Yes, it's not the, the water isn't magic in, in the waters of baptism. Mm -hmm. That's not it. It had to go back down to your faith. Mm -hmm. That your faith is what resurrected you. Mm -hmm. See, it was that you're, you had the bravery of your frail faith to believe that despite how undeserving you were, God died for you. Yeah. And he's trying to remind them of that. Did, was it your merit that, that got you the spirit? Was it what you did? Mm -hmm. If not in the beginning, then why are you acting like that now? Mm -hmm. See, there's, there's usually two ditches of salvation that most churches will have. Some will say that, hey, after you've been saved, if you continue to sin, and you sin once, you kind of go in out of the kingdom, and then once you repent, you come back into the kingdom, that if you sin a little bit, you go in and out, in and out, right? That, that's, that's what they believe. And for me, if, if I believe that, hopefully I die on a good moment. You know what I mean? Like... That, that, that's just in and out of the kingdom. Or there's another one that says, all you have to do is say a prayer, come to church, and you're, you're saved. That's it. You don't have to do anything else. That there's one that it, salvation is so frail that you're in and out. There's another one that, hey, no matter what you do, you're always saved. Mm -hmm. And both of them aren't really correct. Mm -hmm. See, Paul was here trying to get them to understand that Hey, how you initially receive your salvation <coughs> is the same way that you should be living each day. Mm -hmm. Wow. That it comes down to this question, even for us today, is how were you saved? You came to God with a cut heart and relied solely on His mercy. Hmm. How can you now say, well, I remain before Him because of who I am? Because how much I do for Him? I remain in the church because how much I sacrifice. Instead, he's reminding them, no, you need to continue to rely on his grace and his mercy. Yeah. Even in our church today, sometimes we are more proud of our rules than our ruler. Mm. We boast more about the kingdom than the king. Mm. We foolishly say things like, hey, look, at, look how much we share our faith. Look how much we love. Look how much we sacrifice in our church. That's a very foolish thing to do is get people to look at us because it does two things. One, it takes their eyes off God yeah. and gets them comparing and, and thinking that we're the standards when we are not. Yeah. And two, it exposes how much of sinners we are. Yeah. It's kind of like going to a teacher after you've cheated on the test and say, look at it. I want you to double check it. You're like, no, you want to hide that a little bit. Don't you? It's, uh, us boasting about ourselves is only going to get people to say, well, they're not any different. Yeah. In, in, in true respect, yes, we are just other sinners doing our best. Yeah. See, why did Paul understand this? He, he understood that, man, it was not your merit that got you saved. Mm -hmm. So why are you acting like that? Come on. See, when people live that way and say, hey, look at us, it gets people to look at you and, and not their eyes on God. And at the end of the day, we understand that it's never going to be enough anyways. Yeah. No matter how much you share, no matter how much you come to church, it, it, it's never enough. Hmm. Now, what you could do is you can react and get depressed about that. Well, it's never enough. Why should I do it? Hmm. Or you can understand how grateful you should be. Yeah. If I had an item that you really wanted, and you're coming to me and saying, hey, I'll give you anything for it. Like, you can't afford it. 
<laughs> and you give me your, your, all your clothes. And you're like, here, I'll give you all this. I'm like, no, it's, it's not enough. You give me your car keys. You give me your house. You give me all these things. No, it, it, it's not enough. You can't afford it. You're like, hey, I will be your slave to the end of times. Just please give it to me. And I'm still saying, no, it's not enough. Wow. And then one day I say, here, I know you can't afford it, but I'm going to give it to you anyways. Mm. You can keep all that you have. Just use it for good in my will. Wow. Now we understand what God's given us. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it, we never had enough to purchase this from him. But now he gave it to us freely. Mm. It's not about being indebted to him. It's about being grateful. Mm -hmm. they, they, this church, they started to believe <coughs> that their actions, believe more in their actions rather than understanding the power of faith and oh, trusting God. in God. It's not about where you go to church or, or who's preaching to you or how much you do. It's about who are you trusting in. And if it's not anybody other than Jesus, there is no passage of scripture that's going to support your faith. And this can be displayed in many ways in the believers today. I think one way that's crucial is their lack of prayer. The lack of prayer or the quantity of it reveals that they believe in their strength rather than the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And prayer and, and re relying on the Spirit was something that was, that was such a beautiful gift for them in this time. For us, we see, oh, everybody has a Spirit. But at this moment, this would have been the early days when the Spirit was really given to everybody. In the early days of Israel, and if you read in the Old Testament, only a handful of people would have ever received the Holy Spirit. And now, they all have the opportunity to rely on it. And he's just saying, rely back on the Spirit rather than your own actions. Today, when you hear somebody say, rely on the Spirit, can kind of have a bad rep today. I think because people will say things like, well, instead of relying on something I cannot see, I want to rely on my own strength. Something that I can determine and measure. Or you will have others that kind of throw fuel into their argument, where they'll say things like, Hey, I believe in the Bible, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength, and yet they do nothing. Mm -hmm. so, so relying on the Spirit sometimes has a bad name. Either it means that you know, you're not relying on yourself or not doing anything, or you're just trying to uh, do everything on your own. But see, relying on the Spirit is something that should actually make you stronger. Yeah. See, relying on the Spirit makes me stronger in my actions as I try and do things I have no business doing. That, that's what relying on the Spirit does. Is when you rely on something stronger than you, you reach higher than you ever thought you could reach. Right. That's what he was saying. He was saying, this is not a call to stop doing things. This is a call to rely on the Spirit and realize you can even do more. Mm -hmm. Just don't rely on it for your salvation. Uh, your, your actions for your salvation. Because he continues going, he says in uh, verse 4 through 6, Have you experienced so much in vain? If it was really in vain. So again I ask, does God give his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He's just asking, hey, have you done all this in vain? And what he's getting at here is it would be all in vain if it was determined by our actions or our manner. Be all in vain. If we were coming here to church and talking about just being a better person and that's what mattered on the, the end day of judgment, how good we were, this would all be in vain. We're, we're, we're never going to get there. That's what he's saying. This, this would all be in vain if you, it was just based off of your works. But it breaks my heart, though, when we understand what it's really based off of. It's not our works, and so many people can teach that and preach that. Because it gets people to think, I'm not good enough. It breaks my heart whenever I hear people say that they're not good enough for salvation. Because it's, it's never been about being good enough. It's about that Jesus loved you enough. Yeah. Yeah. It had nothing to do with that. Yeah. See, not accepting his gift is shaming Jesus all over again. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't enough for you. Or maybe it's that it was too much for you. And it's too hard for you to accept. That I wish Jesus would have died with a little bit less pain so it's easier for me to accept. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with those things. 
God, you know, you, you, you claim maybe God should have done it a, a different way so I don't feel so bad about myself. Mm. And the thing is, this is not being pushed on you. This is getting offered to you. Mm. It's not like, well, hey, why is a decision in my court? No, you're, you're, you should be grateful that you have the decision. Yeah. This is being offered to you freely, regardless of, of all the other things. And yes, we have to repent. And yes, we have to change our lives. But it's solely reflected on Jesus. Guys, I have my first challenge for this morning is we need to be a church that is more proud of our ruler than our rules. Come on, Sean. More proud of our king than our kingdom. Come on, Sean. Because we can go out there and tell everybody, hey, we're, we're, we're sharing our faith. And actually, I believe we are one of the churches that every single day we go share our faith. I don't see many doing that. Yeah. But that's not the point. Yeah. It's not about who we are. It's about we're doing this because we have an awesome king. Right. Yeah. We're doing this because we have an awesome ruler. Don't worry about the rules. Don't worry about all those things. Once you follow the king with all your heart, mm -hmm. you'll get fired up about his rules. Yeah. You get fired up about these things. Yeah. But don't think for a moment that these are the things that's going to really determine who you are before God's eyes. It's about being you being saved through Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Point number two, invested or indebted. See, when it came to Abraham's faith, it talks about there in verse 6, right? It says, his faith was accredited to him as righteousness. Now, people will take this out of context, meaning all he needed was faith alone and he was considered or deemed righteous. But, again, it does not mean faith alone is righteousness. Look at the words he's saying. It was accredited to him as righteousness. Mm. Meaning... The decision to believe and act upon that belief was a righteous act. Mm -hmm. There's many righteous acts throughout the scripture. Faith being one of them. It's not all you need is faith and you're the now righteous. No, that's not what it means. It was accredited to him. It was given to his bank account. There's a little bit extra faith there. He had other things in there though. Mm -hmm. As we see here in, explained in James 2, 20-24, these aren't contradictory. There's just other righteous acts. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Mm. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, as he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. Yeah. See, Abraham's credit was now being paid in full by his actions. Now again, I don't want to focus on his actions, but his investment of faith years before this actually happened. Right? Him offering his son Isaac, well, his son was a bit older at that time. This promise about him getting a son was made years before. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, the scripture is talking about in Galatians. And we're going to read that. What did he believe? What is this righteous act of faith that Abraham had? If you want to turn to Genesis chapter 15. Come on, Sean. Let's go, Sean. Awesome. Genesis 15, verse 3 through 6. And Abraham said, talking to God about him having an heir, he said, You've given me no children, so a servant in my household would be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and can count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited <coughs> to, excuse me, it to him as righteousness. Hmm. See, this is what the scriptures is talking about, is that Abraham... He trusted in God's word long before he was called to obey them. Wow. And that still was a righteous act before God. Yeah. And I believe that's the thing that we are missing most of the time. Yeah. The reason most of us do not live powerful lives where we're obeying God is because we have nothing in our bank. We didn't get that credit beforehand. We, we, we didn't get any investment. Again, it says credit. It's something that's in your bank waiting to be used. Some of us are even trying to persuade and invest in others. 
I think Chris did an amazing job on Wednesday, his, his lesson, in talking about don't just have people around, invest in them. Yeah. Yeah. But we got to have something to invest in. Mm -hmm. As in we, we have to have something in our bank to actually put as an investment. Right. Nice. Just because you go and say, hey, seek God with all your heart, you're going to have a blessed life. God has amazing plans for you. But yet, you're living a half-hearted life. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, not, you're not living a life that's that's going towards amazing plans that God can have for you, you got nothing in your bank. You're saying these things, but you're not actually investing anything. See, yeah, they actually might be open. It's kind of like opening up a bank account but not putting anything in it. It is not just going to be us reading scriptures with a good heart that's going to change people. It's do you actually believe what you're preaching? See, the reason Abraham was able to get to that point to sacrifice his son is because years before he believed in God's word. Yeah. Yeah. I want to challenge us. Instead of being indebted where we're like, man, I, I, don't, I don't know what else to do. I don't know if I really believe this. I want us to start being invested. Yeah. Start believing in God's word. <clears throat> See, we can show up and say nice things, but it is going to be our faith and trust in God's word that's going to move people hearts. Yeah. Some people will say, hey, well, I've done all I said. I've, I, 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 I showed you all the scriptures I can show you. As though it relied on that. Do you still believe? Mm. That's the investment that we're going to make. Come on, Charles. Is we're not just investing a, a nice passage to somebody. We're investing faith into people. Mm -hmm. We're investing, hey, I am believing wholeheartedly what the Bible says. When I preach the word, it's not going to come back in vain. That's what I'm holding to. Come on. My second challenge for this morning is let's start getting some spiritual credit. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let's not just be preaching the word and going out there and, and, and reading nice scriptures. But I want to challenge everybody. Every scripture that you read for somebody, ask yourself, do you believe it? Yeah. Do you believe in that challenge that you are going to have a blessed life? Do you believe that they're going to have amazing plans that God has for them? Come on, John. Let's start investing in what we are saying. <coughs> Coming into a conclusion, point number three, faith or foolishness. Ooh. Galatians 3, verse 7 through 9. says, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and advance the gospel uh, excuse me, and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You know, again, when we talk about faith, as well as righteousness and all these other little things, I think sometimes we can not really understand what faith is. And again, it can get a bad rep in today's society. Faith is not a blind walk into the darkness. And, or it's, it's not just, you know, um, relying solely on yourself. I think sometimes that people use faith in different ways. Either they'll say, hey, blind faith, all you do is believe and you just do it because that's what your parents do it. Okay. Or others, people claim to have faith, but yet they only look on their lives. They only look at their actions. There are many religions that are one or the other. Either they don't really have any faith, they're just blind faith and just walking into it, or they really rely only on their actions. I think about atheism. I always say, I don't have enough faith to believe in atheists. <laughs> uh, whenever I meet an atheist, I think, wow, how, how do you believe that? Yeah. If, I, if I came to you and said, hey, this building across the street, and I try to convince you that it had no builder, hmm. and I tried to convince you with all my heart, you're like, this person's crazy. What do you mean? I'm like, well, prove the builder. He's not here. Right. Like, of course there's a builder. There's a building. Yeah. Okay, well, that's what you're proclaiming about the world. Wow. That it has this intense design to it, and you're saying nobody built it. Hmm. I, I'm sorry, I can't believe what you believe. I don't have enough faith for that. <laughs> or you have others, other religions. Um, you have the, the Islam. What it talks about is most people do not, if they die as, an, as a Muslim, they don't know if they're going to go to heaven or hell. They, they say, well, it's based off of God and my merit and my actions. I have to earn my way into heaven. That they actually don't have any faith. It's just based off of their actions. <coughs> but see, that's what the Israelites were doing. They had no faith in this church. 
They're simply doing what they were told, and hopefully that was going to be enough. Again, this was not a challenge by Paul to tell them to stop doing anything. He actually continues to tell them, hey, if you want to follow holy, um, holy days or holy festivals, you can. I'm not telling you not to. If you want to continue the practice of circumcision, you, you can. Just understand, this, does not, this is not based off of your salvation. This was not a call to not do anything. But just to understand that it was more based on their faith than their actions. It was foolishness just to think it was going to be based off of their actions. You know, I think as a church, in the beginning of this year, we had the dream to climb to 50. Yeah. And in the beginning of this year, I was foolish. I thought it had everything to do with our actions. And it gets to a point where we're working really hard, and we don't th see things happening. You're like, well, well God, what, what's going on? I'm working hard. You, I, I, I deserve something. And I think that's how we can feel sometimes. Like, God, I'm doing all these things. And then I start reading this lesson, and I'm like, okay, well, hey, amen, i got to focus on God. But then you still go through the stages of, God, now that I'm focused on you, you still got to bring me through, right? <laughs> <laughs> like you're doing it for the wrong reasons still, you know? And so I'm like, okay, amen. All i got to do is just focus on God. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, not, it's not an excuse to not work hard, but... My hard work should be for God rather than the results. Yeah. Yeah. And I even had to learn that. My, my heart goes everywhere. But it's this, it's this kind of thing where we have to fight to just stay focused on God. Yeah. And it can't be we're focused on God just for results. It's kind yeah. of like, have you ever gotten an argument with your parents? And they're like, okay, well, we'll go when you calm down. And you're like, I'm calm. <laughs> you know? It's kind of like, we can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Just focus on God. Uh, Sarah's done that a lot. <laughs> but just in conclusion, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up the lesson here, verse 10 through 14. And then coming up to just focus on Jesus. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based off faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does not uh, does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written, "Curses is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing, blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. He just continues that, hey, if, if, if you continue to think it's going to be based off of your actions, you are already digging a grave for yourself. Wow. You're, you're already cursed. It doesn't make any sense. But instead, live by faith, as destined a long time ago that <coughs> Abraham was going to, to show. See, Christ took all this away from us by being the curse himself. Yeah. See, some of us have been fighting for the Father, for a long time, some of us are kind of new recruits. But this is just an encouragement of why are you fighting? It's not supposed to go, I'm just fighting and doing these things so people will say that I'm righteous. No, get, get, get back off of that. It's not about that. It's not about going out and sharing our faith and all these things that, yes, we have to continue to do, but it's not about those things. It's about being focused on Jesus and Him being our reason why. Let's learn to trust in God again. In the scriptures that he tells us to preach. And in the things that we continue to do in trusting him. That the Bible says that there is going to be a reward for our work. Mm -hmm. As long as we do not continue to give up. When you first got that dip in the water of baptism. You did not believe, well, hey, I'm good enough for this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I earn this. I deserve this. Mm -hmm. No, hopefully you're a little bit like me after I came out. I'm like, dang, hopefully that worked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, didn't get, I didn't deserve this. Hopefully God's a little bit more merciful to me than others. Come on. And that's just my encouragement. Let's go be proud of our king, not just our kingdom. Thank you very much.